Okay, I'm just... All right. Um, okay. So if we understand, if we understand how important that the ocean is, I mean, a few other things just to get it in, in correlation. The first meter of water in the ocean has the same mass as all of the atmosphere out to outer space in the ocean. That is, that is how much, I mean, that's, uh, that is how important, I mean, that gives you an idea of how much influence the ocean has over the atmosphere. And that temperature changes in the ocean control the atmosphere. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, 90% of the photosynthesis on the planet, estimates vary from 75 to 95%, but I've talked to a number of biologists who say uh, 90%. It happens in the ocean. It does not happen equit uh, equitably across the planet. The majority of photosynthesis that happens on the planet happens in the Arctic and Antarctic sum, uh, summers. And it happens along coastal areas where there is upwelling. Where, because the, the open areas, the pelagic oceans, are really deserts. Uh, it's an 80-20, or perhaps better, a 90-10 rule when we come to where is life in the ocean. Life in the ocean gathers around where there's upwellings of nutrient-rich water from the bottoms. And this happens almost exclusively along coastal areas and in the Arctic and Antarctic. Yes? What about tropical coral reefs? Uh, tropical coral reefs are virtually devoid of nutrients. The, that's why the water is so clear. There's virtually no nitrates or phosphates in the water. And they do photosynthesis directly. That's why the water you have depths of, vi you know, you have a visual, you can see two and three hundred, uh, a hundred, two hundred meters deep. But uh, they're uh, they are wealthy for other reasons, but they are, uh, I mean, in life, and especially in, in, in speciation, but in biomass, they do not approach the Antarctic. Next to the sequoia, rain, uh, the sequoia forest, the Antarctic in the, in, the south, in, the, in the summer of the south has more biomass per square meter measured down to the, uh, down 300 meters than any other place on the planet in the summertime. Uh, what? Phytoplankton. Phytoplankton and krill. It's one of the shortest food cycles, too. Directly from phytoplankton to krill to whales on that, and, and to the mammals and the birds. Uh, but it's phytoplankton. This is the bulk of the planet right now. Uh, this is, and so if we understand that life is not distributed equitably and photosynthesis is not distributed equitably, it's distributed along coastal areas where there's upwellings of nutrients to feed the photosynthesis and at the poles, if we understand that, and then if we look at what's happening, there's two obvious things happening. Where is man dumping toxins? Obviously in the coastal areas. There's no underwater pipes where we're dumping things uh, 200 uh, kilometers out to sea. So, and also, uh, the more recent research on uh, the ozone effects to phytoplankton. Have you been hearing about this lately? The minimum estimates are that within 24 hours, there is a, a 6 to 24 percent reduction in phytoplankton in the top 10 meters of the water. And uh, the phytoplankton, it's, uh, there's a direct correlation between the density of phytoplankton and the closest, closeness to the surface. So we're, what we're talking about is perhaps, I mean, the figure I've seen most steady is within 48 hours there's a 16% reduction in phytoplankton. Within 48 hours. And we're talking a 16% reduction of 90% of the photosynthesis on the planet. Yes, Jay? Uh, 40, uh, of the, good, good question, yeah. Uh, of the appearance of the ozone hole. Okay, so we're talking that this is uh, of the major source of photosynthesis on the planet, that this is serious, okay? Now, this isn't the only place where photosynthesis happens. It happens in coastal areas. A good example is the upwellings off the coast of Peru. Uh, but again, as uh, uh, man dumps their toxins, and, espe and, the, and especially herbicides, herbicides work equally as well if not better for phytoplankton than they do for plants at this point. As man dumps the toxins along coastal areas, I mean, Peter Weber said it very good and uh, recently in, um, in, uh, in a, a long article in um, State of the Earth 1994, he said, if man was to wage a war against the oceans, he couldn't have done a better job than we're doing right now. Because the oceans, as I pointed out, they are the lungs of the planet, but not only are they the lungs, they are, they are the, the kidneys, the filters, and increasingly the bowels of the planet. 
So this is, this is what's happening in the oceans right now. There are 17 major, I've got a very good, I didn't bring my, uh, my uh, uh, food and uh, agriculture organization report from the United Nations with me, but uh, the UN has some very good statistics on it. So what I want to say right now is, although we're most concerned about birds and marine mammals and, uh, and uh, against whaling entirely for a bunch of reasons and drift netting, the real issue is photosynthetic and phytoplankton health of the ocean. But if I were to demonstrate with a placard with a blown up a photo of a, a phytoplankton saying we must save our phytoplankton, I mean you're not going to get much sympathy for that because it's not a warm big eyed little mammal baby, you know, uh, that, that people can empathize with as they can with harp seals. So. Uh, I'm concerned about whales, very concerned. I'm concerned about drift netting and enforcement of United Nations treaties. There's major treaties, there's some very good treaties on the book, and I'll get to this later, that are being ignored almost entirely, especially the drift netting treaties right now. Um, but the real issue is phytoplankton health. And, and I want to just state that early and clearly, because so as go the oceans, so goes life on, the, uh, life on land. Uh, life in the oceans can live very well and will live very well if there's a complete uh, die out on the land. Life in the oceans has lived well without life on the land. It lived well for over three billion years. But the oceans in the end will determine atmospheric and uh, biologic health. This is 71% of the planet. I've been speaking at universities on this and I've spoken to a class of 25 juniors at a university and they thought that the oceans were 80% of the surface of the planet. And I've read that 80% of Japanese sixth graders know that the oceans are 71% of the surface of the planet. Our illiteracy of the oceans uh, could be part of our own, uh, our own uh, doing ourselves in. Okay, there are thoroughly, there are no adequate treaties at all concerning dumping of the oceans, but we, uh, but 40% of the pollutants entering the oceans are entering through rivers and direct dumping. Forty percent are coming right in from rivers. This is the FAO. Another very good source of information is the National uh, uh, NOAA, National uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They have excellent information. They're doing some pretty good science. I've been pretty impressed with them. I, uh, and I, I've, a lot of my information is coming from them too. Forty percent of the pollutants entering are coming from rivers and land runoff. 30% is coming from atmospheric pollution from the planet. Just 1%, about, about 5 to 6% is from dumping, boats dumping, uh, bilge, bilges and that in the ocean. But just 1% of the pollution in the ocean is coming from actually oil well spills and things like that. It's actually trivial compared to the runoff. It's uh, what's coming right down the Pigeon River right here goes to the ocean, goes to the ultimate, uh, uh, the ultimate sewer. And that, so that's where it's coming from. You know, we've seen the enemy, and he is us. Okay. Uh, there are basically no treaties with any enforcement uh, on dumping into the oceans. There's some uh, accords and consensuses about nuclear materials, but nuclear materials are not nearly as serious as the toxins, industrial toxins and pesticides. Uh, and uh, th there's there's nothing being done on this right now. There's and that uh, there are uh, there are 17 major fisheries in the world. Uh, the the FAO, that's the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, says all are being fished to their maximum, and nine are in in ma in major to catastrophic decline. So over half the fisheries of the world are in decline. A good example is that we're catching. 90 million tons of seafood a year worldwide. It used to be 105 million tons, but we're catching 90 million tons with double to triple the nets out in the oceans and a, 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 a square meters of net per day in the ocean as we were catching 20 years ago. So if you consider it as the yield of the ocean per the amount of fishing going on, we're catching one third as much also, with some of the new technologies and sonar and all that, it's not a question of are they going to catch fish if there's any there. They will catch whatever is there if they can find it. You've all heard about the, the total collapse of the Grand Banks, the fisheries off, uh, off uh, New Brunswick and, and Labrador. Those are gone. And it's not a matter, perhaps, of waiting a few years. On some of the fisheries, the decline is so bad that, and, uh, that it's questionable whether it'll ever come back. 
Has anyone ever read uh, uh, Chaos of Science in the Making by James Gleick? It's one, and there's a population, there's a, there's a chapter in it on population. One, it's an important book to read to understand, but what we're seeing is chaotic effects in population. And many times what happens is when you do a, a complete disruption of a, a fairly balanced uh, environment, and then you leave it alone, what comes back is entirely different. There's been no fishing of eastern halibut for the last century. They never came back. Eastern halibut are gone, almost extinct. And uh, there's been no fishing of them because they, they weren't economically viable and the, the types of nets you need for halibut weren't even available. Certain things don't come back. The fact that we may leave cod alone for 10 or 15 years does not mean that they are going to be better. Uh, I have a whole slideshow on this stuff, but <laughs> it doesn't work here. Um, we're seeing phenomena, as you've seen dead rivers, and we're talking about uh, coastal areas that are very polluted. We're starting to see dead shallow seas right now, the East China Sea. I've been to Taiwan for drift netting reasons and that. No one fishes off the coast of Taiwan. It is dead. It is a wide open industrial sewer. The North Sea is just about gone. The Baltic Sea is going quickly. So we're seeing dead shallow seas at this point and dead coastal areas. Remembering that ratio, that 80-20 ratio or 90-10, that most of coastal life is in the estuaries. And you understand, uh, is along the coast, and you understand how important estuaries are for breeding, how many species breed in the estuaries, and you know what's happening, that the world's lost half of its estuaries in the last hundred years you know, from San Francisco to whatever. So there is a war being waged on the oceans right now. Okay, I have worked with Sea Shepherd. I do not currently work with Sea Shepherd. You don't need to work with Sea Shepherd at all to do, to, uh, to be able to do, uh, 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 to be able to defend the oceans. Uh, you don't need to work with Greenpeace if you have objections to those groups. But um, uh, the areas that I'm concerned with First of all, it's phytoplankton health, but I, I'm also concerned about the obvious ones, and that's, that's uh, violation of the ban on commercial whaling and violation of drift netting. Drift netting is probably, it does much more, it definitely does much more damage to life systems in the ocean than whaling does. Whaling goes after one species. Drift netting gets whales and everything else uh, and that. There's very good regulations right now, uh, resolutions passed by the United Nations. Uh, uh, 46215 and 46216 ban drift netters right now. The French have some and the Moroccans are increasing their drift net fleets at this point. And this is in clear violation. The world agrees that they're violating uh, it right now. On the issues of whales, all commercial whaling has been banned. It's been banned by the IWC, the International Whaling Commission. Uh, I assume that you're aware that uh, of the, the eight the eight biggest, uh, largest rock whale species are all on the endangered or the threatened species list. Some of them are down, uh, the bowheads and the rights, Atlantic humpback are down to a few percent of original numbers. Uh, and there's been a ban on commercial whaling, but it just recently has been broken by Norway. And I, I don't have a problem with indigenous whaling if it's Eskimos killing a whale and then eating it. And so I'm not going to automatically uh, object to all kinds of whales or something like that. But commercial whaling, as you're aware, uh, is a different animal entirely. It is where, in this case, wealthy, fat Norwegian fishermen go out and kill uh, sp species, some of which are, they're, they're, the Norwegians are demanding to be able to go after fins and say whales too, which are on the endangered species, uh, whereas minks are not. So that they can sell the meat, rest, the, the, the meat to endangered species restaurants in Japan for up to $200 a kilo. And these fishermen, on the average, earn thirty-five dollars to $50,000 a year anyhow. So this is the kind of whaling that, uh, that uh, I object to entirely and that uh, people I've worked with object to, and it has to be stopped. It has to be stopped because when you have an international treaty, the moral, and everyone's adhering to it, the moral approbation is against the first country that violates it, be it nuclear test ban or that. Once the uh, first country violates it, the second one can say, well, we have to do it because they're doing it. And the same thing applies to whales. The Norway say, Norway saying, well, we've got lots of minke whales here. Well, those minke whales don't stay there. They pass through the coastal and territorial and economic waters of 12 other countries. So once Norway starts going after them commercially, there's all the incentive 
for uh, all the other countries in the area to begin whaling too. So it's very important uh, to stop this quickly. So one of the things I want to talk about is tried and true methods of decommissioning whaling ships and drift netters. And these methods work. I've talked with other people who've done them and that, and this is a way where you can uh, do major damage. The damage that you do when you take actions against ships, uh, the damage is twofold. And probably less of the damage is actually... Oh, by the way, thanks a lot for doing that. Appreciate it. Less of the damage is the ship itself. The more important thing that we, c we can do in damaging ships is it really screws up their insurance rates terribly. The Norwegian whaling insurance rates are up 20-fold right now. 14 whalers have gotten out of the business and taken, dismounted their harpoons because we've sunk a few whalers and damaged a few more. So it really messes up their business. Whaling at this area, it, it's a marginal business even with the exorbitant prices because there's so few whales left at this point. And secondly, they have to guard those ships. Security cost are even more than the insurance cost. Once you get a few of their whalers, they have to continue. They have to keep a person out there. The police have pressure to guard. They have to increase their staff. Norway took 150 reservists and activated them and uh, activated six boats. And they said that their total security costs, increase in security costs, were over $20 million in the first year alone. Great. You know, that's fine. I, uh, as much as we can jack that up, that's fine. OK, so how to sink boats. Are you interested in this? And uh, you, can, you can interrupt me at any point in that. This is how we do it. Oh, by the way, a good friend of mine, Brendan's here, former uh, uh, mate on the Sea Shepherd. And uh, Brendan can help you too. Uh, Brendan is familiar with techniques and strategy and that. Um, you all have the boat? Uh, you all have this book? Anyone who doesn't have it? Okay, now if you're going to keep this, I, I, I ask $2 for it, okay? Um, let me get a few more. Uh, but you can look through with this. I just have to cover some of my printing expenses now. Anyone else? Yeah. Sure, sure. Okay. $2 yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Okay. Uh, believe me, I, this is a total loss proposition. I don't, I don't get rich on this. Fat cat. <laughs> Spiritually rich, okay. Of course. All right. Oh. Okay, um, the critical factor to bringing down a ship is getting aboard the ship undetected. That's the critical factor. If you can get aboard that ship undetected, you've done over 50%. Okay, some of that means finding the ship, finding the right time to get the ship, things like that. But that is the critical factor. And um, so you have, to, you have to locate the ships. I mean, we know where a lot of them are, and we know the ones that are guarded. We know the ones that aren't being guarded very well. We have good ideas of ships that aren't being guarded at all. Okay, but th that is the critical factor. And it might mean waiting until the national holiday at 3 in the morning when they're all drunk mm -hmm. and uh, that. That's a very good time. Uh, one of the critical things that we do in getting aboard the ships, I mean, it may take a collapsible kayak. It may be anchored in the, in the bay. That's good news if it's anchored in the bay. Because if it's anchored in the bay, you can set up a lookout in a harbor. Uh, we've done that before where we've uh, just uh, set up a, a post uh, uh, a mile away with a 60 power scope and we've watched a ship for two and three and four days and we've seen no lights on the ship, we've seen nobody in it and that and then we go out to the ship and we've uh, we've scuttled ships in the harbor. The advantage of it being out in the harbor like that is you have a better chance of determining whether no one's on board. I want to say this, I don't think you can sink a ship with people on board and I definitely don't think you want to try and that. So every ship we've ever sunk, all the ones I've boarded, I've always checked the ship to make sure no one's on. And that's probably the highest pucker factor part of the operation, is going around <laughs> seeing if there's people on the ship after you're pretty sure there's not. Because what do you say to them in a foreign tongue if, you know, they're wondering, what are you doing there, you know? So um, you have to be able to get aboard the ships undetected. Oftentimes they're berthed on docks. 
and if it's uh, in the winter time, which is a very good time to go after them, if there's snow there, you can just see if there's tracks. I mean, usually we would say a, a, a fair amount of reconnaissance, but the, if they see you doing any reconnaissance, the story's over and you got to leave, okay? And you're just not going to be able to pull it off uh, without... Um, uh, with, with any knowledge. Surprise is absolutely essential. You have to balance off getting information to when you think no one's on the ship, you know, to, uh, the, to exposing yourself. There's a certain trade-off. There's all sorts of things. People have put 55-gallon drums on the dock and have cut holes in them, little holes, and they've just posed as a barrel of chemicals or uh, oil or something. People have literally uh, hung themselves in um, uh, uh, mountain climbing gear under docks, just hung there under the ship, just you know under the dock. Whoever looks under the dock to see if someone's hanging there, no one ever, you know. But typically, getting the ships when they're not in season, when they're in storage, and that some of the ships have dual usage. Some of the wha our whaling ships, Norwegian whaling ships, they will also use for uh, 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 fishing. But uh, some of some of the whaling ships, Japanese whaling ships, are just used for whaling and nothing else. Okay, and. Uh, so that's the first critical factor. How do you do that? You have to be in the country, you have to watch, you have to get aboard the ship, uh, and you have to choose times. And sometimes outrageous things do work. Uh, we've had people get a job in a factory right next to the Icelandic whaling uh, fleet and work there for two months and just work in a factory uh, processing cod. And then one night they went in and sunk half the Icelandic whaling fleet and were gone. I mean, there's also each each scenario is different, and that. But the important thing to understand is, if you put the ship underwater in a harbor, they're probably going to refloat it anyhow. If you get that ship down to its bridge, down to its helm, the ship is going to have 50 to 75 percent of the value of that ship destroyed. So many cases when we scuttle a ship, uh, the Icelandic is a good example. Those two ships were then raised because they were blocking the harbor. They had to get them out of the way at a, at a price of a quarter million bucks per ship in addition, and then the ship was sold for scrap. Now, they may very well rebuild the ship, but all the electronics, the navionics, the motors, all of that, motors don't run very well with salt water in them, uh, filled with salt water. If there's any mechanics here, they'd laugh because they know how devastating salt water is. So putting the ship underwater devastates it, even if they're going to refloat it. And anymore, we're noticing that the Norwegian whalers are moving the ships into quite shallow water. So when the ship goes down, it'll list and lay on its side rather than go completely under. I mean, that's one of the preventative, preventative actions they're taking right now. Besides having to move the ships, they're, they're moving them around all the time. Good. That costs them money, you know, and that. Okay, so you get aboard the ship undetected. Something that I always do when I get aboard the ship is I take a half-empty bottle of booze with me. Uh, because if I'm detected, and I've actually been caught on a ship already, and I've just pulled a bottle of booze out, and when they, a person came up to me speaking Fujian, asking something to me that I sure as hell didn't want to stay around and find out, I just lifted up the bottle and took a swig and got off the ship like I was a drunk in port. And um, that's not unusual, because uh, port sides are pretty sleazy places with a lot of drunks around, you know, so that's just that's good camouflage. So I would say the moment you get aboard a ship, is hide on the ship and wait. And it, you'll have a tool bag with you. There's a list of tools uh, in this, and I'll explain the tools to you. You'll have a tool bag. I would hide with that tool bag hanging over the edge of the ship with a rope. I put the tool bag so it's just hanging right above the water, and I hide on the ship in stairwells or this typically something that's, that's uh, 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 bunkered down that I, I crawl under and I wait because if, if five to ten minutes you're gonna find out if you're seen if someone across the harbor saw you and they thought you were suspicious they'll come over to the boat and that so I wait and that's kind of a high pucker factor too once you get aboard the ship is waiting to see if you've been once you're convinced that no one's seen you then you can go to work surprising a lot of the ships are left open I've been surprised that you don't have to cut or bolt cut the locks or pick the locks or things like that. But uh, oftentimes there's three or four people working intermittently in the engine room. Electricians, mechanics, engineers are coming in and out and they will leave the door open because it's such a hassle. And if you hit them at the right time on a weekend or a national holiday or something like that, odds are that that very well could be open. On that. And I've been amazed to see boats worth tens of millions of dollars left wide open on the dock. Okay? Now I'm going to see how this is going to... Okay.
this isn't very good. I'm sorry about this. I don't know if you can even see this. Can you? I'll see if I... Okay. I think this one is permanent. Yeah, that one's permanent. Okay. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm sorry about the pans. I, uh, I, all ocean-going ships have water-cooled diesels with them. There are no air-cooled air engines in, uh, in ocean-going ships. All major ships in the ocean have to have saltwater intake valves for a number of reasons. Uh, to cool the engines, typically. That's a major reason. Also, you need saltwater for firefighting, for washing down the decks, for a bunch of things. But all ocean-going system ships have four to five liquid systems, fresh, uh, water, salt water, hydraulics, fuel, um, depending on the ship, uh, they could have other things too. But all ocean-going ships, this is just a, a, an outline of the ship. Can you see that roughly, just an outline of the ship? There will be a salt water intake pipe, a seacock coming in on all ships. This is, this is the outline of the ship. They will all have it. They have to have it. It will vary in size depending upon the type of ship. Some of them will be 18 inches, 18 inches across. Yeah, I know it's not going to show up. But uh, it'll be 18 inches across, and you can, a ship like that, you can down a 500-ton ship in an hour and a half. It can really go down fast. There's, a, there's another type of ship called a keel-cooling ship that'll have a smaller intake. The Norwegian whalers are keel-cooled. They'll still go down, but it'll take about six hours. The important thing, once you get aboard the ship and they don't see you, you may have to bust locks, pick locks, pry locks. You may need acetylene cutting torches, whatever you need. You have a toolbox with you. You have several options. If the boat is locked, you have to be able to get into the ship, into the engine room. Have to be able to do that. And that is not that difficult. I mean, I don't know, you know, you, there, are, there are books that'll teach you how to pick locks. Bolt cutters do wonders. Three-foot bolt cutters can do an awful lot. All the tools that you need to bring down a ship are going to be available in the country where that ship is. And you have to get those tools there. You don't want to travel through customs with a three-foot bolt set of bolt cutters. You know, lock picks are probably the only thing you may have to travel through customs with, and then you have to disguise that really well, or you're going to have to come in a different way. But all the tools that you need on the tool list in the book, you can get that stuff with the exception of one or two things, and maybe there's a few things you don't want to get there, okay? But the issue is you break into the ship, you get into the engine room. The engine room's always in the bottom, and it's typically uh, a little bit closer to the stern than the bow, typically here. And I have never found a ship that did not have it's seacock in the engine room, the pipe that leads in. Brendan, have you ever seen a ship that had a seacock outside of the engine room? No. Uh -huh. Sometimes, uh, you know, there's different places in the engine room. Yeah. Be, but you can always find at least one pipe bringing the seawater. The idea is you follow the pipes. Follow the thickest pipe. You get into the engine room and you just have to follow the pipes and eventually you're going to find a pipe that leads either to the side or the bottom of the ship you may have to very well take off scaffolding. You may have to d unbolt the, the, the scaffolding that they, that they walk across, lift that off to get there. But sometimes you'll see the clear side of the ship and here's a valve coming out. You got it, that's it. It can be the bottom. Sea Shepherd had one on the side. Norwegian whalers have them on the bottom. It depends on the ship. But you keep following the pipes and you will find the seacock. Okay, so you find this valve. Now, I'm, this is in the pamphlet. This is just terrible. Okay, you find this valve, the seacock. It's roughly like this, let's just say. It's got a handle on it here, okay? The handle's like that, and then the pipes come out of it like this, the pipe to distribute the salt water. This is the bottom of the ship. This is water down here, okay? So you find the valve, and it's got a handle here. God, this is terrible. I'm sorry, I, I thought I'd be using a different pan. Okay, what you have to do first thing you have to do when you find the seacock is you shut the valve off. Completely shut the valve off. You have to do this to reduce back pressure on it. Because what we're going to do after that is we're going to take the pipes apart. And you don't want to start flooding the ship. It may take a half hour to take the pipes apart. You don't want to start flooding the ship until you have water pressure off. Now, you are, they're always supposed to have these valves shut anyhow. But we've scuttled ships. Uh, the Nebrania, the guy left the valve open. That was stupid of him. And it cost me more time. I had to shut the valve, then do the work. He should have had it shut for me anyhow to start with. It was bad seamanship on his part. So you shut the valve off completely. 
The next thing. God, I, I just got to do something about these pens. I'm about ready to do this in permanent pen, okay? This is just too bad. I'm going to do it in permanent pen because this is the important part anyhow. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll take alcohol and get it off again. So, okay, this is the valve right here, the handle right here. You shut this off, you close the valve right here like that. And this is a pipe coming out. There'll be a pipe right here. There'll be several pipes. As close as you can to this now, you take off the pipe. You're going to need a uh, pipe wrench. We, we use pipe wrenches. We do. We use monkey wrenches. Yeah, I mean, it's not an archaic tool for us. It, uh, we, we use them. We put them to work. And, uh, so you take this pipe off here. You drop this pipe. What you have after that is then you have an open valve. And I'll just draw an open valve on this side. You have an open valve like this, but no, nothing's coming out of it. When you take it off, you'll get a little bit of bleed. Don't be surprised when you unbolt it, that water shoots out for a little bit. The pressure should go down if you've got this valve on. The pressure will go down. You'll get the bleed. If you, if you had pressure on here, the pressure can be so high because this can be five or six meters under water level that the pipe could crimp and move slightly like that and you'd have water shooting all over the place but you wouldn't have the 500 ton an hour uh, leak that you'd want. You may have a 50 or 100. You want the biggest leak going. So you have this open, you have the valve closed at this point. This is just waiting to blow. The next thing we do is we take the handle off. This typically, it can have a hand handle. I've got, a, I've got one here from a whaling ship I can show you. It's the only thing left of it. Um, I didn't bring it, but um, I mean, I've got, it, uh, I've got it in the tent. And you take this handle off. So what you have then is just a stud, a post there. The reason why you do that is if they do get aboard the ship in time, they could quickly close it. So you take the handle off, it's just a post. They're not strong enough to close a valve like that. I mean, these, these handles can be the size of steering wheels or bigger, okay? So you take the handle off, you got a post here. Then you take your pipe wrench and you open the valve. And when you do that, water just flies out all over the place. It'll sound like you're taking a shower under Niagara Falls. I mean, you got to stay calm at this point, keep collected. What you do at this point is when you've got the major flow of water coming out like that, you want to jam this valve at the top now. I mean, you've, you've got them good right now, but if they did come in, they could take a pipe wrench, theoretically, and close that valve and stop the ship. So what we typically do, or what we have done, is we've taken three-foot pipe wrenches, monkey wrenches, and at this post here, which might be this high and a three-quarters of an inch high, we've hit it as hard as we could. It makes a lot of noise. But if you get it out of true, if you bend that like that, it's locked open. So you can have a valve locked open with hundreds of tons of water coming in an hour, thousands, depending upon the type of valve. So at that point, you've got them pretty good. What we say is if you can stay calm and collected enough at that point, or if you've got two people in the engine room, go and cut all of the diesel injectors and all the hydraulic lines that you can. Because if you cut the diesel injector lines, they may have V16 diesel engines down there, it's going to assure getting salt water in the engine. So if they do raise the boat, the engine is finished. It's ruined. The amount of labor it'll cost to rebuild it will be worth the, the engine itself. It'll be a quarter or half million bucks for the engine alone. So if you can, it just, it's real quick. And you've got at that point so much uh, adrenalized energy that, I mean, you can just, I mean, you could snip through anything at, at that point. You know, you're running on uh, adrenaline at that point. So you snip all the diesel injectors, hydraulic lines, everything. I want to say, yeah, you're probably polluting the ocean a little bit at this point when the boat goes under. But it's not as much as they would through the course of the life of that ship. Okay, so after, after that, this is something we really recommend doing. As, is, and, and you're wearing gloves the whole time, body suit of gloves, the whole works. You're gonna get filthy in the engine room. I mean, it's a toxic dump site. It's rust and diesel fuel. I mean, it smells, it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a very pleasant place to be. After you do that, pack up all your tools in the same bag. Get out of the engine room. Maybe the engine room was locked and you had to take a bolt cutter and cut it off, open. Well. We feel it's very important. I mean, what, you know, we've just damaged their locks. We feel it's important to replace their locks with our own. So we th what we do is it's very important to have long handled locks, not little padlocks, but very long, heavy duty $20 locks. So we replace their locks to the engine room with our own locks. We feel it to be highly improbable that their keys are going to work on our locks. Okay. And the same thing goes for the door that you entered the boat. If the boat were locked up, if it wasn't locked up, put a lock on it, you know, 
uh, and that. The idea is we're buying time because you want to get to critical mass on that boat where so much water is in that they cannot bail it out at that point and it's going to go down. And after you've done all of that, let's say if you've done a coastal job, you're right, it's been berthed along dock, along side dock, and this is the one that is, at this point, you really want to, what we call GTFO, get the heck out. Um, you really want to go at this point, but it's important to stop for another five or ten minutes and cut and let go of the mooring lines. And these can be three, three inch thick hemp, hemp lines. And it can be a problem because if it's in the winter, they can be frozen uh, solid. We found that hacksaws work pretty good on them if they're frozen. And cut the lines. The thing is, if the boat drifts 15 feet away from shore while it's sinking, uh, they've got another major problem. They won't be able to uh, tie it up to the dock. So we, ideally, the boat will drift out a little bit, it's sinking. If you've done all of that, uh, uh, you, you, you probably own the ship. Something I didn't mention that's in the pamphlet, and this is your choice, and uh, we've never done it, but people have suggested it, is right before you close the engine room door to throw in a tear gas canister. So if they did get into the ship and try to, uh, try to do it, and did try to get in the engine room, they're not going to be able to with tear gas. I have some qualms about that, although it's in the pamphlet. That seems like that's getting, uh, I mean, that's a poison. You know, and uh, so I don't mention that except that you're going to read it in the pamphlet and uh, you can sink ships without tear gas, that's for sure. The issue is if you can get aboard undetected and into the engine room, you should be able to find, you should be able to find the seacock and do it. You don't have to sink an entire whaling uh, fleet. Sink a few of them and that really messes them up. It messes up all their maritime insurance policies entirely. And contact them saying, oh, yeah, we'll be back. I mean, if you bring one, if you bring down one, you've got complete credibility complete credibility you know they they don't question that you're going to do it again i mean that you've already done it so you can do this for drift the same thing applies for drift netters it applies for whalers and it doesn't take sinking them all uh, a few of them can drive whole countries out of whaling it's critical to start right now because iceland and norway's resumed commercial whaling and we've got chile russia and japan talking about resuming commercial whaling and it's not just minke whales we're talking about fins says and a few other species and they lie they lie, they lie, they lie. The Russians said they killed 128. You, you saw that? Uh, in the 128 blue whales in the 60s? It, now they admit that they killed 7,200. Uh, seven, I mean, that's, that's a bit of an ex a discrepancy there. Whales don't report their deaths. You know, we know that. So, I mean, you can figure if they say they're thinking about doing it, they probably started already. And whatever numbers they say they're doing, that is an absolute minimum number, and it doesn't count the wounded ones that got away and died. It doesn't count anything like that. Uh, this has to be done right now. This is one of those critical areas where we don't have any more time. There's no, it, there's no time for debate on this issue. Uh, I'm not sure that blue whales are going to make it back anyhow. That numbers range from 6,000 to the lowest I've seen is 385. I mean, that's the most they've ever seen all at once at one time in the ocean in the last two years where they could document. They extrapolate, but whales do not. They're herding and potting creatures. They do not spread themselves equally over the ocean. They stay in tight groups. They have rigid and fascinating patterns. The blue whales typically, the, the Pacific blue whales, typically feed three to four months a year. They go down to the a Antarctic in the winter and eat krill for three to four months, swim up to uh, the equatorial zones, and just hang out on their blubber for eight months and don't eat at all. That's, I mean, but the issue is they stay in groups. And if you kill a pod off entirely of whales, it's not like others say, hey, there's a big niche over there. Let's send 10 of ours over there to fill out that pod and be fruitful and multiply. When pods die, they seem to stay dead. They don't replenish themselves except through migrational accidents and things like that. So it's a critical issue right now. The, the question of is there enough to, uh, genetic diversity amongst the existing whales is a real question. Uh, whether they have enough species to maintain enough genetic, genetic diversity to survive is a real one, and it has to be done. A lot of the people who've been doing it have indictments and warrants for them, and it's difficult to travel, so we're out spreading this pamphlet trying to get others to do it. Uh, if you can get a whaler or a drift netter, you know, I'm not choosy, whatever you get, uh, we, we'll furnish the first few cases of Guinness and a bottle of scotch, and we'll try to help you with your expenses and that. Um, and, uh, but it's a, it can be one of the best uh, spiritual feathers in your, uh, feathers in your spiritual war bonnet. And uh, it needs to be done, it needs to be done now, and uh, we want, uh, 
uh, scuttlers to be fruitful and multiply. We want you to be the first in your bioregion to sink a whaler. Um, and that's so. Uh, I'm sure you got lots more questions on this, but if you got the pamphlet, you can look through it and return it to me, or obviously I'd like you to buy it, because I could use the money to cover travel expenses and that, but uh, questions about anything? Yes? Yeah, after you, or before you want to uh, open the Tucson, yeah. would there be any bills along, alarms that you have to encounter? Um, there could be. There could be. I've uh, never run into one, but there could be. But bilge alarms typically work within the ship itself, you know, within the ship. I mean, uh, the issue would be, do they have bilge alarms that would radio, that would buzz, an, uh, you know, an onshore building? And I would think that Norwegian whalers are starting to put in that stuff right now, you know, uh, that they're starting to put in some kind of bilge alarm that they can pick up from onshore. Those are expensive systems, communication systems. Those cost thousands and thousands of dollars. That, that's a possibility. And on a Norwegian whaler, it could work because they use keel cooling systems. And basically, uh, keel cooling systems don't have as big a pipes coming in. And, the, the, and I probably should explain this. If anyone does a northern whale ship or, or all of that. Believe me, it's possible. People have sunk ships based upon this information. Um, on keel cooling systems, God, I got a, I'm really disappointed that I brought the wrong pen. On, on most ships, You have the engine here, and then you'll have a, a large heat exchange radiator. And it's just like a car radiator, except instead of having air going through it, you have cold seawater going through it. So you have seawater being pumped from, uh, from the seacock. But on keel-cooled systems, what they have is they have the radiators along the side of the ship, right on the keel of the ship. They have the radiators, and so the hot uh, coolant is, is, is sent right along the side of the ship and you don't want to cut those lines because you're not going to get any salt water in there so you have to find the seacock separately of that those ships keel cooled ships still have uh, uh, intake lines of from 10 to 12 centimeters those are 150 whaling ships they'll still have that so you just have to be sure to keel cooled ships which are always northern ships because keel cooled ships don't cool enough in warm tropical waters on that so you have to make sure on that that you don't follow the the coolant lines from the engine, but that you find the seacock itself and just find the pipes and work backwards. We've literally scuttled 300 ton ships in as little as seven minutes and as long as an hour and a half. So that's the time. Seven minutes is about the record where it was just sitting there, right there, wide open, about 10 minutes. It was less than, from time of starting the work to ending the work was less than 10 minutes. And that was on a big flow, about a 300 ton flow. So, um, uh, anyway, I, w I wanted to mention keel cooling, but yes, they could have that. They could have that. But if it's just an in-ship bilge alarm, if there's no one there, it doesn't make any difference. Questions? There were some questions over here. Yes? What about just setting explosives on the side of the ship? No, I don't, uh, I don't endorse explosives. Uh, I just don't do it because uh, two things. You can kill somebody and... Uh, um, uh, that'd be a media uh, public relations d disaster, and I could look at uh, I could look at a judge and say, "Yeah, I scuttled a whale ship and do my time," but I couldn't look him in the eye too well for explosives. I mean, it, it really. I mean, I, I consider this sabotage, and I consider the use of explosives as potential terrorism. I mean, terrorism doesn't mean the killing of people, but the threat of killing of people. And I I don't know if anyone's ever sunk a ship here before, but it's really not very violent. It's about as violent as letting the air out of the tires of a car with the exception that the car doesn't sink through the pavement so, <laughs> so anyway I mean I, I, I simply will not endorse uh, explosives another thing is uh, you know I, I don't want any people around because of the potentiality of violence I mean uh, hey if you're attacking the property as far as they see it they've got the right to shoot you you know and uh, that's uh, I mean this is not a college prank this is dead potentially deadly serious the stakes can go right to the top uh, but there's also great rewards in getting a few scalps too. And if you do get a ship, bring back something from the ship, the seacock handle, the nameplate in the, in the, in the, 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 on the bridge, something like that, some souvenir, you know, we don't, you know, we want to have uh, something for ourselves, something to give, uh, to, something to show. Questions on anything about the oceans? It doesn't, yes. Uh, what, can you give us an update on um, all the legal stuff with 
I'm indicted in Norway for sinking uh, whale ships and damaging another. And um, I don't know if they're going to try to extra extradite. I mean, if I had not been indicted, I wouldn't be giving this. But it, be it became public evidence when I was did everything perfect except I had my Swiss Army knife and going out of the hatch of a sinking ship, my knife hooked onto it and broke off and I had my name on the hatch. I mean, on the, ni on the knife. And, you know, I thought I did it perfect. And uh, so my name was there. And uh, I mean, so I obviously didn't do it perfectly. Um, and I went back into the ship for about 10 minutes in, it was like 15 below zero and the water was like an ice sludge coming through. It wasn't coming through real fast, but it was coming through. And uh, feeling around in my arms trying to find the knife in deepening seawater. And I couldn't stick my hand in, it was too cold, so I, I was working with my gloves, I couldn't feel it. Finally, when it was up to my shoulder, I just thought, uh, you know, like any good rat, get off a sinking ship, you know. It was, I, the ship had hit the fan and I didn't want to hit it with it. And that. So the legal things is, some people have scuttled whale ships and they've done nothing, especially if you get violators of international treaties. David Howard brought down two Icelandic whalers. They know he did it. Uh, there's no question about it that he did it. They never tried to extradite him or even prosecute him because of the embarrassment of violating international treaties. Myself, I would love to go to the Hague World Court with Norway on the violation of commercial whaling. Mm. And no one questions that they're violating an international treaty. They have signed on to it. And IW, they're a member of the IWC, and IWC rulings are international law. The Norwegians are violating it. And maybe, I mean, this is the, the legal part of it that you have to do. But count on it if you get busted in some countries. If you got busted, bring it on Driftnet or in Taiwan, they may dump your body in the harbor. Norway, you'll do, you can do two years in prison. Uh, Iceland, I, I don't know. Japan, they'd be very hard-assed on you, but again, these countries don't want bad publicity with the United States, especially if they're trading partners with the U.S. Or they do a lot of business, and it's embarrassing, and whaling isn't a big industry. So oftentimes, they ignore it. They really do ignore it. I was tried in abstentia in Norway last month, and I haven't even heard from him since then. Uh, I figured it was better than in presentia. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but um, uh, I, um, I don't, I'm not going to let the legality of it stop. Uh, I mean, uh, stop the extinction or you know stop the wholesale resumption of commercial whaling. Uh, the issue on the legality is, is GTFO: do the job and get out, and then sit back here and uh, and uh, if you. I mean, see, in my case, they have a lot of evidence, but they don't have much evidence against you. Uh, then uh, it's really hard for them to extradite. Now, again, don't commit any heinous crimes. You use an explosive, it's way easier for you to get extradited. Yeah, and if you can do this, I think it's got more class. That's kind of the brute force thing to use explosives. It's de classe to me. I, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's the difference between a good fencer and someone swinging a sledgehammer or something like that. Uh, I. Uh, it's it's two it's two Navy Seals type and uh, and that and uh, and it, and it also gets them more pissed off to kind of sneak in and, and and do it like that. I mean that'll get them really angry and you won't have much sympathy in the United States too. And in the end, a lot of the battle is going to be media. Whether you want it to be media or not, it's going to be media, because you're going to embarrass them. You're going to bring the issue to the front, and uh, they're going to have to defend their violating of treaties. And they would be very happy if no one ever talked about it ever again. You know, and this, if they start making a, a lot of noise about it, then it's going to be in the, the public. Do you have a question? No, I'm fighting there. Questions on oceanic issues, uh, actions, anything like that? Yes? Uh, Roy, um, is there any, any word on getting a Earth first oceans group together? We sure need it, that's for sure, because uh, I cannot in good faith recommend that anyone work with Sea Shepherd whatsoever. Can you, Brendan? Um, basically, every, the dynamic Shepherd is a rather hierarchical organization. Understatement. It's wonderful, <laughs> but eventually the, there'll be the one personality conflict you get into and you're out. Yeah, and, and it, it happens with everybody. Every single person who's ever been on Sea Shepherd has been kicked out. I quit. I wasn't yeah. kicked out. But it's still, you know, the adventure of a lifetime. Mm -hmm. mm. So, so to go out to sea with a bunch of anarchists searching for drift netters. And, uh, I mean, and to be able to ram a ship. Yeah. One thing about ramming a ship, man, is you get to see the looks in their face. You, know? <laughs> you don't get to see that when you scuttle a ship. If you get in and out of harbor, you know, it, you know, it, it all goes kind of, uh, you know, you know, you are the only, if you do it by yourself, you're the only person in the world who knows what the world's headlines will be the next day, you know. And that's kind of a nice feeling, you know, you know what the papers are all going to be saying. But, um, I, um, I have to say this because I've sent some people to Sea Shepherd and I've uh, just really been, um, I've, they've had um, some terrible experiences 
Uh, and so I cannot, uh, in, I mean, uh, in good faith, recommend that people work the Sea Shepherd. What we need is our own boat, and um, uh, it's long overdue. But uh, mind you, the best actions that have ever been done have been done without a boat. Boats are extremely expensive, and they're not just one-time expenses. They're steady, annuity-type, out, outflows of cash. You know, to have any good boat, it's going to be half a million bucks a year if you've got great volunteer crew on that. And we don't seem to have that. But these good actions, I mean, we've sunk drift netters for $2,500 and whaling ships for 4000 bucks, And you can find people who will give you that money, for that, that kind of money. I mean, uh, I think, uh, you know, the, I mean, some of the better, ac the most expensive actions would be ten dollars or $15,000. There are people, and I'm not going to get into specifics right now, who would fund something like that. And also those people would demand absolutely no violence toward any living thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you go around, yeah. Donors that you know of, or, or there are people, you know, I, you know, that feel that the situation's serious enough that uh, um, a scuttle is an appropriate reaction to uh, violations of treaties. I mean, uh, no one enforces the UN treaties. I, I would wish that the United States Navy would. I got a vignette about that. We pulled the Sea Shepherd into uh, Norfolk Harbor in uh, Virginia in uh, 1991, and we couldn't get any commercial dockage. And we were coming in right at nighttime, and the Navy, being so hard up for money, would release us com naval space for free. I mean, not for free, but uh, uh, I mean, but right in, right inside the amphibious area, where the, you know they've got these underwater tanks and these landing crafts and all that. And they didn't know who we were. They thought we were uh, uh, some kind of commercial ship. So we come in, and the next morning they look at our ship, and it's all black, and it's got all the kill flags on the side. And, you know, we're right in a secure naval harbor, and they wonder, who are you, you know? And so before we know it, you know, uh, we've got a military guard there. And I get out of the ship, and I always whizzed off the side of the ship, and I'm out there whizzing. I see a guy watching me with binoculars. You know? So I waggled at him and that. And, and so they came over and they said, what kind of ship are you? And we said, we're an environmental defense uh, ship. And uh, he said, well, what are these killed? You know, what, what are you doing? He said, well, we try to stop. We enforce international treaties and all that. And this immensely fat harbor master for the Navy who looked like he had had a mighty long and hard career getting drunk at the golf course said he started making fun of the ships and what the hell kind of ship is that what a ugly ship is that and I just got tired of the guy I said how many ships you ever sunk Jack you know and he was used to having a bunch of ass kisses around him so that you know there was always yes sir no sir and we started you know making fun of his uh, career at the golf course you know and we we knew we had to leave at that point anyhow they kicked us out you know so so uh and i said something that sounded pretty stupid at the time i said why don't you guys go out there and enforce international maritime treaties yes. I said that to him, and he said, oh, ridiculous, no way, we'll never do that, never do that, get your ship out of here, you know. And September 1993, the United States Navy announces that it's, it's reprogrammed all of the underwater acoustical and sonic devices to be able to track drift netters and interdict them if necessary. It hasn't happened yet, but the Japanese and the Taiwanese know, I mean, the U.S. hasn't interdicted them yet, but we're listening now, the U.S. Navy is listening to the North Pacific so the Japanese cannot lie and the, uh, and the Taiwanese cannot lie like they have been about taking immature salmon and all of that. So just that presence has made a difference. So what I want to say is, in thinking big, I mean, people, the things that we've endorsed, we endorsed uh, in the late 70s, a complete moratorium on all commercial whaling. That happened in 1984. Uh, we endorsed a complete boycott of a, of a, a complete ending of a drift netting uh, in, in 1987. Well, that happened in 1992. We're just five years ahead of time. That's the only difference, and what we're being called radical for now, we're just five years ahead on that. And the United States' Navy listening in the North Pacific and in the Pacific is one of the main reasons I feel that the Japanese and the Taiwanese have pulled out of the Pacific, and the South Pacific too, on that. Yeah, the whole ocean floor around there is just littered with all these sonar devices yeah. that are the size of oil refinery tanks for really? tracking submarines, for waging nuclear really, war. Really, really. Uh -huh. It's called the Sound Surveillance System. Yeah. Um, the headquarters for it is in Suitland, Maryland, just outside Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. They can track individual whales. Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, the Navy used to use whales for depth charge practice. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, the, the, they did, they used whales for practicing depth charges on that. Questions on uh, specifics, actions, uh, things like that? I got one point. Yes. I don't know if you already covered it because we got here late, but do you have any um, comment on the Scripps Institute? 
that uh, that uh, that uh, that high acoustical. Totally against it. Totally against it. Um, uh, whales can hear each other from two to three hundred kilometers. That has that is definitely documented that they can hear from two to three hundred kilometers, and um, uh, and they do have you know and, and and the amount of energy that's being released could clearly do damage. And we're doing enough. It's just a uh, you know I mean there's a, a, a wholesale assault and attack on the oceanic biosphere that's going on full bat blast faster than on land. I want to say this: it's go it's going faster than on land because when you have a clear cut forest. You can tell, but when you have a clear-cut drift-netted ocean, it looks the very same the day before as it did the day after. Uh, an ocean devoid of life from the surface looks the same, and most people, that's all they see. All you have to do is talk to old salts around the ocean, and old salts don't mean 70 years old anymore. They mean 50-year-old people. They'll say, God, I used to see all sorts of whales. I used to see all sorts of dolphins when I was 20 years old. You never see them anymore. All sorts of turtles. They're not there anymore. They're not there. Fogley Morwat has documented it extremely well in The Sea of Slaughter, a must-read book, by the way. Did you have another question on top of that? Um, someone I was talking to that was looking into that whole script thing said that it's, they had heard from some Greenpeace guy that was really kind of um, besides the point because there's already incredible amounts of noise in the ocean. It's almost like... Um, uh -huh. You know, almost experience what's already going on. I, I have heard that too, that oil tankers make so much noise and all of that. I don't know what the effects are. I just don't want to add any more to it myself. And what's that, what is it, to, discuss, to measure, uh, wh what's the main purpose, to measure atmospheric and oceanic uh, pollutant level uh, changes? Uh, uh, because warming. Yeah, okay. Temperature. Yeah. You've got to study that more. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, we want to we wanna study for 30 years while industrial dominance goes, uh, wreaks havoc. Uh, on, an, uh, on it. Um, I mean, I'm just against, uh, I mean, basically, the, probably the best thing to do is wherever you can pull man out of the factor, human, uh, negative human influence out of the factor, do it, you know. The best restoration is just to pull hominids back, uh, it seems to me. Um, yeah? Yeah, they do. In, in the Antarctic, the Japanese are uh, right now, they're doing it right now, and they want to increase it to a thousand, minke whales. It's commercial whaling, and it's the they have it's the only factory whaler existing in the world. Yes, they're doing that right now. They want to increase it to a thousand, and they're talking about going after other species too. They're not just minkas, which are thirty-foot whales, which are relatively common. And that, um, yes. Oh, that no, that's wonderful. That's good news. Except that those whales are just down there feeding in that in the Antarctic summer, you know, and and it's from forty latitude. South. I mean, that's that's good. That that is like a hunting season. That's ending of a hunting season. But a lot of those whales come north beyond 40 latitude, and that no, that and I'm I'm, I'm I, I, that, that's great to me. That's wonderful. I want to see the Antarctica as, a, as the world's first international park. You know, you can do good science on an international park. Pack in, pack out. Everything you take in, you take out, and uh, good science. And don't touch any. Uh, mammals and birds whatsoever and on fishing it has to be all agreed by international treaties you know krill or whatever whatever's taken it has to be rigidly adhered to in treaties and, that, and that's a good start I mean it's one of those you know it's like the delisting of the bald eagle and the California gray whale that's a good start but for every one or few things that happen like that there's a hundred other things going in the opposite direction um, did you have a question did you oh, oh. okay yes Mm-hmm. Uh, I spent a lot of time on ships. Later. Really? Were you in the Navy? No. Uh-huh. I had a captain fight. And I've been on four different vessels in the Ram by day vessels. Wow. And one time, uh, blocking missile tests and things like that. Far out. Um, and, you know, like, in one time, the Navy even went so far as to get the engineering diagrams of our ship and figure out exactly where they wanted to ram us, which they did uh, over the course of maybe 12 or 14 times that day. But what the uh, older chapel thing didn't show them that we relocated our outboard <laughs> fuel stack. Uh huh. And so even with that level of care was a really very very dangerous maneuver. Uh, yeah. And uh, I just don't I just don't believe it can be done safely. I, I I'd have to say it's much higher risk than scuttling in harbor. Much much higher risk. And typically uh, aboard the Sea Shepherd, the rams that we've done have been glancing rams to knock off the. The, the knuckle booms and the winches and the, the blocks, you know, for fishing and that. Uh, there's only been one, like, uh, head-on ram that we've done at Sea Shepherd. Yeah, I agree. And uh, you, you kill somebody, 
uh, no matter how much that person's doing eco damage, the first the headline is going to be boat rammed, one person killed. You know that'll be the, and that'll be the big issue. It change it takes the whole issue. Uh, you know, I don't have a boat to ram with anyhow, you know. Uh, I, I, I agree, it is much riskier to ram than it is to scuttle a ship. The glancing rams really don't do much. Um, you know, when the ships ran, ran those two uh, drift netters uh, uh -huh. uh, in the North Pacific, I think it was 1990, I was out there uh, a week later and those boats were fishing. The same boats? Oh, I did not hear that. That's okay. It's something, okay, that's interesting. I did not know that. Okay, that's disappointing. Uh, I was told otherwise by Paul Watson, but that's not unusual. There's a lot of creative history in the Greek campaign. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> is there some history? Yeah. No, no, there is something good about it, though. The publicity, the issue of getting it on the screens is, is useful. The issue of, uh, and that is useful. There, in the end, it is a media war. It's a war for minds in that. And, uh, uh, and you can get uh, really good alliances with coastal fishermen. The salmon fishermen are all in favor of our drift net ca campaign. We've got major contributions from uh, Alaska fishermen's organizations and that. So uh, maybe creative uh, history, I mean, it, 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 the, the end results, I mean, there are, the drift netters have pulled out of the North Pacific in the last year or so. Uh, the, the end results, whatever it took, that's, that's a good first step, you know, on that. I think one of the interesting things in the drift net enforcement is the uh, retasking the KH-111 satellite to do uh, surface monitoring. So okay. Uh huh. Well, Navy wants that too to justify uh, not having to cut back. I mean, I guess my feeling is is that uh, since there's going to be a military for a good while to come, if they if they do something like that, I mean, I'm less hostile to them. I'm more in favor of it. Uh, I do feel that accurate information, the fact that the Japanese and Taiwanese know that the United States knows what they're doing in the North Pacific, has made a difference and that the September 93 announcement of saying that the reprogramming was complete and they will be able to detect the numbers of ships, they'll be able to listen to and identify every ship's got a unique fingerprint, a screw, a screw print, you know that. You know that. Have you ever, when I've been out at the Sea Shepherd, we've had, uh, off the coast of Puerto Rico, we've had U.S. Navy helicopters come up about 100 meters off the side and just hover right along with us and drop a microphone into the water and they were taking our fingerprint, our sonar print and then they just put it into the computer bank and they can hear that sound any place in the world and know that it's the Sea Shepherd. So uh, they can do that with drift netters too. And, uh, it, and it's not as complex a task as you think, uh, uh, you know, if you get it into a database like that. So they can tell and they can also measure the lengths of the nets now. They're sensitive enough to measure the lengths of the nets. And I think that's made a difference. My feeling of that is uh, I, I support the Navy on it. I'll support anything I can to get to, to end drift netting. Uh, I, I agree. I agree. I'm just saying that the situation is so critical right now. I mean, that when you're down to the last, uh, it's so critical. I, mean, I agree. I, I, it should be civilian in, enforcement. But uh, I'll take anything I can get right now. Any questions on any other issue, techniques, legalities? Uh, uh, yes? He's got to because he's accepted about $150,000 in contributions for it, and he's almost obliged to get a submarine. I would be the last person to get aboard it. Um, it will be an old submarine. I would never get aboard it. I mean, we had enough trouble keeping our ships running, you know? No, I mean, the one thing about a submarine is it could strike fear. It could strike fear, but realistically, it's such, it's, it's going to be a, a, a white elephant of expense. I think he, what he'll do is he will buy it just to honor the pledge that that money was pledged specifically for submarine. And I'll bet you this, within six months he sold it again. And he keeps the money and he'll have some, some explanation of why he had to sell it on that. I think that it is a tactical error. <laughs> I'd never paint it yellow like he wants to. I mean, I, I, it doesn't. Uh, I think it's, it's a fundraising thing. And Paul said something, he quoted Admiral Perry, and there's a lot of truth in this. Paul said, 95% of any expedition, and you could, sub, su you could substitute campaign for that, is fundraising. I don't know if it's 95%, but I do know of a lot of good actions that never happened or that petered out because you ran out of money. Is that true or not true? And it's true, so 
if uh, if something like that raises money, then uh, it, it has there's something to be said about it. And that and Perry said that 80 years ago, 95 percent. I hope it's not 95 percent. I hope it's just 50 percent. You know, but uh, or whatever. Does anyone uh, want to buy those or you want to return them? Okay, sure. Okay. Okay, I'll be having the same workshop Friday morning, 11 o'clock, if you know of anyone who missed this one.